Good morning, everyone. Feel free to um, unmute yourself and say hi at this time before you get muted for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> hey, everybody. hey, everyone. <laughs> I see Andy got the red memo. <laughs> hey, Carlos. Hello. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Diana. Hi. Miss you. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Same. <laughs> So you can see him at the beach, enjoying the sun. <laughs> keeping this heat wave. <laughs> yeah. Is it hot up in uh, San Francisco, Andy? Nice and foggy, just like Jean's supposed to be. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I think we had our first gloom this week. I kind of walked out and it had been perfectly sunny. And then I was just like, oh yeah, summer's here. Summer. <laughs> You guys are hot in LA. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm pretty close to the beach, and it's like 90 degrees by me. So I don't want to know what it's like in Diana's world up there in Valencia. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be a scorcher today. Our HOA—they just reopened our pool, though, so I'm very excited. Oh, that's good. Well, I wrote a nice email to uh, fire season and told it it could bug <laughs> off this year. So we got enough. Yeah, there was actually a fire near Castaic like yesterday or something. So yeah, we don't need that. Good morning, everybody joining us. We're gonna probably start in five minutes or so, but feel free to say hi to everybody. Um, show your face if you choose to. I'm only dressed up because I'm leading this today, but <laughs> by no means necessarily do you have to be dressed up or have lipstick like I do. <laughs> Hi, Leah. Hi. Hi, Leah. Hi. Good to see you. Hey, Rich. Like at the beach. I'm glad that you said uh, no, no lipstick was okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you want to put on some lipstick, Rich, I will not hold it against you. We're going to give people another probably, I would say, at least five minutes or so. Um, but feel free to say hi. I see Jerry has joined us. Hi, Jerry. <laughs> hi, this is Joni from Portland. Hey, Joni. Hi. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm wonderful. I'm so glad you're able to join us. For all of you guys who don't know, Joni was executive director of TTMA for many, many, many years, way before my time. <laughs> Hi, Joni. Hi, hi, Jerry. How are you? Ah, I'm so alive. <laughs> I unmuted just to say hello to you. Okay, well, wow. So cool to see you. It's been forever. I know. I you. I'd say you look amazing, but I just see your name on here, so. Okay, I'll try to do the, the rest of it. <laughs> the rest of the audio and the visual. That's I'll good. You look good. All right. Sarah Ann, congratulations. Oh, thank you, Joni. Hi, Jessica and Hi. Anne. I love seeing all the familiar faces. How are you guys doing? I have to scroll through to see. There's, I guess, two pages now. We're up to 44 people. This is so exciting. <laughs> I think we might get more um, attendees today than we've ever had at a TTMA event, but let's see. <laughs> and again, just for those who are just joining us, um, we're just taking a few minutes to say hi, show your face if you choose to um, before everybody is muted. Hi, Susan. <laughs> hey, everyone. Hey, Sarah. <laughs> Oh, hey, <laughs> great to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. Hey, Dee, how are you doing? I love this. Look at all these lovely faces. I, I see we have Portland, we have San Francisco. Hey, Sarah. People. <laughs> I 
Oh, this is wonderful. Thank you all for taking time out of your day today. Hopefully you're as excited to see everybody's faces as I am. <laughs> hey, David. You can feel free to unmute yourself and say hi at this time if you'd like. <laughs> Only if you want to. Hi, Sarah. It's Don. Hey, hi Don. There. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Happy to do it. This is wonderful. Hi, Sarah. It's Ginger. Hey, just, Ginger. <laughs> I'm not on camera. I'm actually driving. So. I was going to say, I don't see you by your pool, so. <laughs> no. Okay, I'm going to be honest. We're driving to the beach right now, so. <laughs> as you should be. As you should be. <laughs> But I'll be listening in, so thanks. Wonderful, wonderful. Hi, Sarah. This is Brian. Thanks for having me on. Hey, Brian. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Look forward to uh, well, seeing everybody now and uh, sharing. That's wonderful. All the brave individuals who are showing their faces, I applaud you. <laughs> I know when I'm on large Zooms, it's very rare I show my face. I. I uh, for those who just recently joined, I only got done up just for you guys today, you know. <laughs> I think this was the first time I actually put on a dress and earrings in a very long time. <laughs> we feel very special, Sarah. Thank you. I'm glad I can make you feel special. <laughs> Perfect. Um, we're probably going to start in just a couple of minutes. I see we're up to 67 participants. Pretty exciting. And if any of the other board members want to take a moment to say hi, um, you know, feel free to use this time. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all. Beverly Center's open. I was going to say, where is your update, Carlos, and your voice? <laughs> Just in case you were wondering, Beverly Center is open with limited stores uh, from 11 to 7, Monday through Saturday, and on Sundays, 11 to 6. We also have contactless uh, curbside delivery from 11 to 3 every day. Um, but uh, yeah, some big news happened today too. Back in February, Simon bought us. And as of today, Simon decided they're not buying us anymore. So, woo! <laughs> we get all the intel from Carlos. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, don't blame. Hey, me and Elizabeth, we don't work there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I know that's Kristen. It's really hard to, to make sure I'm seeing all the little boxes. I see um, uh, Nikki. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not camera ready, Sarah, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're always camera ready, but thank you for joining us. I see we, see, we have Michelle from the San Diego Zoo. I'm going to just call people out. We have Meredith. Just opening oh, soon. <laughs> Hello. Wonderful. Michelle, the zoo is opening on June 20th, or when are you guys opening? That's right. We just made the announcement this morning. We're open to the public on June the 20th. Congratulations. Ooh. That's awesome. Yeah. Pretty exciting. All right, everyone. I think we're going to get started just to honor and respect everybody's time that you carved out of your day. And um, so I'm going to have Misha, our wonderful host, um, mute everybody and um, share her screen and we will begin. <laughs> okay, I unmuted myself, Misha, but I'll wait till you get um, your, your screen shared. And bear with us, you guys, if my dogs bark, I've tried to put them in another room. Um, hopefully my internet will hold up, but uh, this is, you know, virtual experience. We're relying on technology here. <laughs> I'm gonna give Misha another minute to get her. There we go. I'll I guess we'll go back to uh, the first screen if possible. <laughs> All right. It's, it's, it's been very, very 
uh, slow, I think, because we have so many participants on. Okay. So bear with me. There we go. No worries. No worries. Take your time. All right. Um, well, good morning and welcome to our first ever virtual TTMA event. Um, I'd like to begin our program today by officially introducing our interim administrator for TTMA, Misha Boxer. Born and raised in the greater Los Angeles area, Misha has a heart for SoCal. She's experienced in event planning, promotions, and digital marketing, and has demonstrated a history of working in the entertainment, holistic, outdoors, and travel and tourism industries. Her career started in the education sector, doing PR for Los Angeles Valley College, and has taken her to companies all across Los Angeles, including Hard Rock Cafe, Allied Integrated Marketing, and the Hollywood Pantages Theater. Misha founded Misha Boxer Marketing Services in 2016. She believes that everyone should find a positive way to unwind, which is why you can usually find her out in the forest rock climbing or on a hike or backpacking trip, participating in some good old nature therapy. Let's all welcome Misha to the TTMA family. Thank you, Misha, for all your hard work over these past couple of months. Do you want to say something, Misha? Yeah, I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm just, thank you everybody for, for joining us today. And I'm really excited to be um, joining the TTMA team um, and diving back into the travel and tourism market. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll all get to see each other soon and I can, um, you know, get to see everybody in person. So fingers crossed. <laughs> Thanks, Misha. Um, I don't know if your PowerPoint is stuck but I think it's on the wrong slide. Okay, and, and you can move to the next one <laughs> if you can. <laughs> yeah, it's just, again, it's bear with us um, because there's so many people on here. We, we tested this out yesterday and it was flawless. And of course today, no worries. Um, just a quick um, thumbs up. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Just want to make sure my internet was working. So as we have all experienced, these past few months have been nothing less than difficult for our industry, our city, and all over the world. On top of everything that we've experienced with the COVID-19 virus and the effects on the travel industry, this past week has been one of the most traumatic weeks in my memory and in our shared history. There have been so many emotions swirling in my head, like many of you, that I don't know where to begin. We have now crossed an unimaginable threshold, the deaths of hundreds of thousands of victims at the hands of the deadly COVID-19 virus. Businesses closed all around the world and many of the frontline professionals risking their lives every day to help those in need, including many in hotels, serving first responders and aiding homeless people. This has occurred on top of the heightened emotions brought to light in regard to the daily acts of racism and violence against the African-American community that have been going on for way too long. We are saddened that protests designed to express genuine anger, concern, and frustration about systems that do not seem to work for all were overshadowed by those who would bring violence and looting to our community. TTMA stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and strongly support equal justice under the law, not only in Minneapolis, but also here in Los Angeles and globally. TTMA also needs to pay attention to what we stand for and who we are as an organization. What can we do better? These are questions we need to and will address going forward. Through these painful and troubled times, I am ever mindful of TTMA's values and the positive role they may might play to be brave, passionate, empathetic, and inclusive. We hope that all of you have remained safe healthy and strong during these trying times and we are here to support any of you in any way that we possibly can. Thank you to all of our members and guests for joining us today. Um, we have a ton of you and it's very, very exciting. As it is tradition, we usually go around the room and have all attendees introduce themselves. But with our overwhelming response of over 100 attendees, the most we've ever had, Unfortunately, we are unable to do that today. So instead, we will take the next few moments to use the chat box to say hello to your colleagues, introduce yourself, and share any message that you'd like. 
If you are a guest of TTMA or this is your first TTMA event, please let us know as well. During the program, please also message me via the chat box with any questions you may have for the speakers. Um, I will also take time to do that at the end, but I will now pause so you can utilize the chat and take a few moments to network virtually. <laughs> This is so exciting. So many people and people I haven't seen in so long. <laughs> we'll take a couple more minutes just for anybody who hasn't messaged that would like to. Again, thank you guys all for joining. This is amazing. 97 participants and a lot of people I haven't seen, a lot of people from out of LA area, out of California. Thank you guys all for joining us. Um, feel free to continue to utilize the chat as you um, feel so necessary, comments, whatever you guys would like. Before our program begins, I'd like to acknowledge our TTMA board. Our executive committee members, Kevin Lorton, past president, Diana Elmore, vice president, Carlos Montenegro, co-treasurer, Jerry Harris, co-treasurer, and Lauren Schlau, secretary, as well as all of our other board members. Thank you to all of you for remaining focused and committed over the last few months. Your work is very much appreciated. Um, there's no way that I would be able to keep this smile on my face without you guys. <laughs> and now for our program, which I'm pretty excited about. As you are aware, our industry is cleared to begin opening again to serve visitors. What could this look like and how can we make the best of limited capacity into the foreseeable future? I am pleased to introduce three expert panelists to speak about the road to recovery. They will share best practices and marketing strategies now and as we emerge as an industry. First, we have Don Skioch, CMO of the Los Angeles Tourism and Convention Board. 
Don Skioch has been the Chief Marketing Officer for the Los Angeles Tourism Convention Board since 2011. He is responsible for marketing and promoting Los Angeles as the premier destination for leisure travel and meetings and conventions to both the domestic and international consumer and travel trade. Renowned both nationally and internationally as a global brand marketer, Skioch leads LA Tourism's global brand strategy, market growth and innovation initiatives as well as the organization's global digital and communications efforts. He oversees the activities of LA Tourism's international marketing offices all over the world. He is a strong believer in growing talent and empowering a team. Previously, Skioch has served in many other roles at various institutions, including the California Academy of Sciences, Universal Studios Hollywood, Baskin Robbins, just to name a few. Um, he has a much longer bio, which is available um, online as well as in the invite. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to allow Don to take over and um, share his knowledge. Terrific. Thank you. Um, Sarah, can you nod or wave if you can hear me? I just want to make sure that I'm good. Okay, excellent. Um, thanks so much. And it's a pleasure to speak to you guys today. Um, I know I have uh, uh, 10 minutes to go through about a dozen slides here. and I'll also mention that what is happening here as it relates to both the pandemic, uh, coronavirus, as well as the epidemic, in terms of the protests, um, uh, while it's riddling us um, all across the country, here in LA, things are very, very fluid. And I'm gonna share some information today that's not even in my slides because it broke this morning. And um, um, I'll, I'll get through the slides and answer any questions you have as well. My agenda today is I wanna go through um, some data sources we're using to determine how to open back up uh, for, for tourism. There are four of them listed here, but I'll go through these in a moment. Uh, number two, the first wave, um, and the way we're approaching this is in concentric schools radiating out from Los Angeles. And so the first market to recover naturally would be the drive markets. I'll talk about that, but I'm also gonna talk about a staycation initiative uh, that we just received a sign off today uh, from our executive team that we'll be presenting to our board later this afternoon. I've got some updates in terms of what's happening with our peers in the industry. And then I wanna talk for a moment about uh, how our decision-making process occurs in our creative update. I think, Misha, do you advance the slides on my behalf? There we go, thank you. So uh, this is a very popular page and it gets updated at the first of every month. Um, this is the hotel occupancies, according to Tourism Economics, who we've used for years. They're the industry standard when it comes to uh, forecasting tourism. Um, for the balance of 2020, these numbers have gotten much more favorable since June 1st. So as you can see here in the chart, uh, January, February, March, and April are act actualized. You can see that we hit a bottom in April at about 25% occupancy. These are county numbers, not city numbers, but LA County. And then you can see the, the, the incredible improvement uh, that tourism economics is forecasting for each month. So for the month of May, I, I put this in green. It was originally in May, they thought about a 25% occupancy. They're now thinking it will come up as high as 36%. Just this morning, I saw that the county for the past week is almost hitting 40%. I think it was 39.8 according to Smith Travel. So I think these numbers are even somewhat conservative. Um, as we build out the year, you can see the numbers jump by about four or five points, but from May to June, each month has jumped by almost a minimum of 10 percentage points. So things are looking very, very positive. And I think these numbers are realistic. I don't think they're liberal or conservative. They're just realistic numbers. The reason why we break 50% in September is because at that point is where you'll see all the different um, segment, segments of business, whether it's drive markets or short haul markets or long haul markets, they'll all start firing at the same time, so to speak. But people are always very interested in this page. Next page. Okay, here is the lodging report, and this is through May 30th. So you can see the one that I always keep an eye on here is although rates super important, I'm watching the middle black bar. You can see that we bottomed out back around April 11th 
And um, every week we add about two or three percentage points of occupancy. So for the week of May 24th through 30th, we were at 39.3. As of this morning, we didn't quite hit 40%, uh, percent, but I'm gonna share some positive news in just a moment that I think is gonna make these numbers really start to improve. Next page. This is the city report here, and you can see um, in the chart up above, occupancy is at 33.5 for the most recent week. That is very consistent with the past week. It's not included here. Uh, one of the reasons why we're seeing a lower number here is uh, part of it is due to rate, and you have a lot of people that may be asymptomatic with coronavirus that are actually sheltering in hotels. A question that we also hear quite often is, what does project room key mean to the hotel count. So let me give you a couple of numbers. Um, our total number of rooms, hotel rooms in the county is about 106,000. Of those, uh, just over 3,000 are project room key right now. So uh, when people ask, you know, this homeless initiative, is that really taking a lot of our hotel inventory? It's not. It's about three, maybe three and a half percent of the rooms. So it's not having a huge impact on the occupancy numbers and I've been told they're not even included in the Smith travel numbers. So these are, these are real occupancy numbers uh, that you're seeing here. Next page. Um, here is, oops, we skipped over one. If we can go back one, Misha. Here is the California Corona case count. And one of the problems that LA County has had is this ornery coronavirus just doesn't want to fall. Um, certainly it's flattened out, but it, it, we haven't seen it fall uh, per se. Um, the easiest way to look at this is a five day or seven day rolling average because it's very lumpy. Some days we have a lot of new cases reported, some days there are fewer. So we look at a rolling five or seven day average. Um, the um, California Department of Public Health has said that we really should have seen um, a peak of cases around May 30th. Uh, in the last two days, they are starting to come down. Yesterday, we had 800 new cases in LA County. To, um, I'm sorry, two days ago, we had 800 new cases. Yesterday, we had 1,200. And that's coming off a peak of about 2,400 cases a day. So that's cutting about half. So that's really, really good news for us. As far as deaths are concerned, and I know that that has less to do with tourism, um, but we had um, 52 deaths yesterday. The day prior to that, I think we had 12. So we're starting to see that come down um, as well. We can go to the next page. We have, we have that listed. And um, so you can see here that they're projecting a peak around July 1st and that will settle down. The reason why this is important, I hate to talk about this macabre subject, but the reason why it's imp important is because of consumer confidence and they still have fears about getting out into the market. So one of the things that LA has to contend with is a lot of people saying, let's go to Yosemite, let's go to the desert, let's leave this urban market where we feel safer. So I'll talk in a moment about how we're gonna to try to counter that with some advertising that hopefully will get started around uh, mid-July. Here are the drive markets that we'll focus on um, in uh, about a month. We are currently working on uh, advertising, new advertising creative. Uh, a challenge we have is because of the protests, we've been unable to shoot. So the city put a moratorium on any TV or movie uh, production. We're hoping to get news today that we can actually get back out and shoot the advertisements that will start running July 15th. That's when we'd like to be on air. There are eight markets listed here. The ones that you see in bold are the markets that we've been in for the last six years. That's San Diego, San Francisco, Sacramento, and Fresno. We've always been in those markets. Um, the new ones are Palm Springs. We added that because of its proximity. It's a very efficient market. It only costs us $18,000 for a four week or a six week flight. And then they also have a very high household income. So we added that into the mix. We added Las Vegas, because that's the first out of state market that we've added, but it is a drive market um, and um, it has great reach. And then down below, you'll see we also added Phoenix. Phoenix is a great family market um, and it's a huge advertising DMA. So if you look under target population, Phoenix is actually bigger than San Diego. 
So when you roll these all up, we'll be sent, spending about $600,000 exclusively on digital media. You won't see this on television, um, uh, but it's uh, digital media because that's how we're hitting the 25 to 44 year old uh, core target. That also doesn't mean that people younger than 25 or older than 44 aren't gonna get the message, but our primary media buying target is that sweet spot of 25 to 44. Thank you. In terms of what's happening from a peer standpoint, uh, Brand USA, they continue on a monthly basis to look at consumer sentiment, and they are looking at starting their marketing efforts again in the international markets as early as August 1st. Uh, the natural uh, first to be lined up would be Canada and Mexico. Um, we are actually seeing a lot of Mexico smartphones coming into LAX. So one of the other things that LA Tourism is doing is we're using a company called Uber Media, and we have geofenced the city of Los Angeles, we have geofenced the TMD hotels, and we have geofenced LAX so we can look at smartphones phone devices coming in and out of those three markets. And we're seeing that Mexico continues to rise as an international market. We're looking at Canada because it behaves like a domestic market, particularly Vancouver, and that's a you know two and a half hour flight. So we're keeping an eye on Vancouver as well. And then I think then uh, the next series would be Australia and Korea, and then perhaps China. In the case of China, you've probably seen some of the rhetoric about flights coming in and out, whether U.S. carriers can get into China and whether China carriers can come into the U.S. Yesterday, uh, the uh, federal administration said we will allow two flights a week into the major hubs in the United States. So that's, I would say that's more of the political rhetoric that's now starting to open up a little bit because they under how, understand how important that is to the recovery of our, of our market. Visit California will be spending somewhere in the area of six to, million, six to $10 million on an in-state effort. Uh, this has now changed as of yesterday. Um, uh, I, I spoke with Lennon Carpenter, their CMO. They're going to be moving the timing of August 17th. They're gonna pull that forward to July 15th. Let me explain for a second why that's happening. Um, that's when we'll start to market in our drive markets, but we're expecting the LA County Public Health Department to announce sometime today or perhaps tomorrow that hotels will be open for leisure uh, bookings, uh, not essential bookings, as early as this Friday or possibly on Monday, June 15th. So that, that's breaking news. We're waiting for them to confirm that. That hasn't been finalized, uh, but that's how the winds are whispering right now. So I think that's great news for us. Um, uh, the LA five DMOs, which are LA, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, Maria Del Rey, and, and uh, West Hollywood have come together, and we're doing a five-way co-op, and we're looking at leveraging a $100,000 spend with Expedia. Expedia has agreed to match that, um, uh, $1.50 to every dollar spent with quality media. Um, so more details to follow on that, but that would start sometime around July 15th as well. Next page. And then just media decision dates here. So the media planning is finished for us in those drive markets. The buying, we had to do about five days out. The reason I'm sharing this with you guys is because we don't want to um, lose any money if we have to cancel. So any of the media that we bought, we bought under the condition that it can be canceled or postponed in the event that we have a second wave of coronavirus. Right now, we've got our fingers crossed that that won't, that won't occur. Um, but um, we'll have up to two weeks out, so July 1st, if we have to push the media out front. I think I'm getting close to my final page, so there's something um, else I wanted to share with you guys that is also uh, a breaking news. Um, we'll be working with, uh, or uh, presenting to our board today, a bridge month strategy. That would be from this weekend to until we get to July 15th in the drive markets to do a LA DMA in market initiative. We're presenting that to our board today and that will be um, on our website. Whoops, that will be on our website and um, um, I can give you guys more details of that um, if you'd like to participate in our next member uh, webinar, which occurs on June 17th. We'll go through all the details of that program. 
you can sign up at members, or I'm sorry, member communications at latourism.org. I'm going to say that again, member communications at latourism.org. Once we have board approval this afternoon, we'll be able to share that freely with you guys because there's some additional spending that we're doing. My final page here is just creative update. Um, we're assuming at this point that activities will be open by July 15th. Beaches will be, be full, fully open as well. And we'll have three different spots. One spot is gonna be focused on beaches and we'll cast a family. Uh, the rationale behind that is that is the highest search return on Google Analytics right now. Everyone wants to take a beach vacation. Um, we'll have a second spot that will focus on hiking. That will be a solo traveler with their dog. I'm thinking Brian Churchill, his wife will have to stay at home, but he'll bring his dog out for a solo hike. Uh, we did that because that's the most popular activity on our website. And then third, we'll have a sunset spot that will be more romantic involving a couple and the reason why we chose Sunset is because that has the highest recall and the 19 focus groups we've done around the world. So that's the update on what you guys will see coming down the pike uh, July 15th. And I think that's my final slide. I think that's it. Yeah, so a big thank you for listening and I'm excited to hear from the other two speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, we actually have a couple more minutes. So I don't know, Don, if you wanted to say anything else that you felt like you had to rush through, um, we're ahead of the game. Um, and also if anybody missed, Erica has sent in the chat that if you wanna sign up for the webinar, you can email Erica Hartman. Um, but Don, do you have anything else that you wanna share or? Yeah, I will. I'll give you a little more detail than around um, this bridge month that we're talking about. So if we get the news that um, hotels are open for leisure travel tomorrow, uh, my team specifically, Bill Cars, Jamie uh, Simpson, Shelley Leopold, um, have worked very, very hard to work quickly to get um, an earned and owned media initiative where on our website, you'll be able to see here are those businesses that are currently open or when they're going to open. You can sort by geography, you can sort by category. Um, uh, all of the safety protocols will be listed. So for those of you, it's really important that you have your safety protocols because LA Tourism wants to be a curator and a communicator, but we don't wanna take any liability for businesses that are trying to reopen. So just make sure you have your safety protocols in place. Um, I think we will come out with a press announcement for that as long as um, we hear that the, the hotels are open for leisure travel. Travel will probably send a press release out on June 17th. Um, I'm also trying to get approval from our board to do some paid advertising within Los Angeles so that people are aware of this initiative so we can get people moving around and back into hotels. The final um, uh, point I'll make, and then I'll turn it back over to you, Sarah, is um, we are seeing that there's a tremendous amount of pent-up demand. So uh, we are getting lots and lots of inquiries of what hotels are open. People are suffering from cabin fever. They want to get out, even those within LA County. So that's really, really positive news for us. So we're going to, probably bad expression, but we want to try to fan the flames of getting people out safely um, and, and ensuring that people can get back into the hotels, take advantage of activities, our attractions, our museum. Um, if every Angelino did a three-day weekend and they went to three restaurants, they went to three museums, and they did a three-night hotel stay, it would generate $1.8 billion for the economy, and it would generate 20,000 new jobs. So just, just within the LA County, LA DMA, that's how uh, impactful this economic recovery could be so we're really we're really going to work hard to get behind it and really push for everyone that's wonderful thank you um thank you so much don this was valuable valuable information i know i enjoyed it i'm sure everybody else here did um we are going to have a q a section at the end um i also wanted to apologize if any of you have colleagues or friends that weren't able to join um we capped at 100 and i did not realize that i i do apologize i know there's people still trying to get in um, as far as sending out um, the presentation, I will need to get approval. So we are recording it in case we can either send out um, the full presentation or maybe just an audio version. Um, but if people do have questions, feel free to reach out to myself or Misha. 
Um, thank you again, Don. Um, this was great. And next up, we have Brian Chan, Senior Director of International and Domestic Markets at South Coast Plaza. Mr. Chan is a globally recognized international marketing leader in the retail tourism industry. Currently, he is the Senior Director of International and Domestic Markets at South Coast Plaza, the highest grossing planned retail center in the US and the West Coast's largest shopping destination. Under his leadership, South Coast Plaza has continued to build its international reputation with increasing qualified annual visitation and revenue. Prior to joining South Coast Plaza, Mr. Chong was a 12 plus years veteran for Macy's, where he oversaw the organization's international marketing efforts. Um, again, his bio is much longer, but it would take a lot of time to read that. And um, I'm so excited to have uh, Brian join us. So without further ado, Brian, feel free to take over. Oh, hi, everyone, and thanks again, Sarah, for the uh, generous introduction and, of course, for having me on this uh, call um, to not only be able to share um, about the retail opening, but also just to get a chance to see and, um, you know, chat with everybody. So, um, you know, what a pleasure it is. I know this is a strong industry and we'll be able to all recover together. Um, <clears throat> so for today, I have prepared... Um, First, a timeline of how coronavirus really affected South Coast Plaza. Um, take you guys kind of through the, uh, the the process of the past three months, and of course, um, the next segment I'm going to focus on our reopening plans and talk about exactly what we're doing, especially on the uh, safety measures that we have. Uh, and the protocols that we have uh, for reopening. And then I'll lastly chat a little bit about, you know, sort of the uh, marketing uh, outlook going forward. Um, what are we doing changes as far as strategies and, and things that we can all sort of benefit to um, adapt to this new reality. So um, without um, further ado, I just wanted to first make sure that uh, video and uh, the, uh, um, the audio is working. It's because right before when you were doing my introduction, my somehow, the, uh, uh, the Zoom disconnected. Uh, and I guess that's part of the uh, virtual meeting for everybody. But anyway, um, it's back on now. I hope everything, okay, good. Okay, so um, uh, I have very few slides, basically only two. So there's not a whole lot of uh, advanced uh, slides to do, but I'll walk you through. Um, the uh, first slide is about a timeline and I put it together just very brief um, key dates timeline that we have experienced at South Coast Plaza. So. Actually, for this whole coronavirus, back on January 26, if you see, look at the left-hand side, January 26 was actually the first confirmed case of Orange County, and that's when it actually really just affected us. So we really had an advanced, um, I don't want to say warning about this, but certainly an advanced impact on this, uh, um, this, 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 this uh, pandemic. So on the 26th of, of the, uh, January, when this uh, first was announced that OC had a first confirmed case, it affected us directly because there was a rumor that this person um, visited South Coast Plaza prior to he or she being hospitalized. So that um, had a huge effect uh, on um, sort of the news and, and, and the coverage right away. So so we immediately took steps. Um, first, of course, um, this was a false rumor. Um, we confirmed that with the Orange County health officials that this person never visited South Coast Plaza prior to being hospitalized. Um, but we did have that chance to really get some advanced warning and starting to prepare for um, you know, safety and health and, and, and kind of uh, wellness of all. So we've started to install the uh, hand sanitizer stations and having masks available way before the pandemic really took over the society. So we actually in mid uh, February even ran a promotion and I was really hugely successful. Um, but come around in March, um, when all of us sort of, you know, the entire society kind of ground to a halt, uh, March 17th was when South Coast Plaza closed. Um, and as you can see, that's even two days prior to the California state issuing a state at home uh, order. So we were really ahead of the uh, um, the curve, shall I say, to kind of, you know, get that, get that warning and get the, um, the, uh, the preparation started. So um, obviously since then, all of our retails closed and uh, about 10 of our restaurants, I think, remained open during the uh, uh, March to uh, May to do takeouts and deliveries and such. Uh, on May 8th, the state uh, issued a um, 
stage two reopening, uh, which allows some retail. So a week later, we didn't do it immediately, but a week later on, the, on May 15th, we launched a curbside pickup program, which is a contactless pickup program where you can order or a phone order online, uh, online or phone order, and be able to come to a designated uh, pickup location, designated spot, and be able to have your um, merchandise delivered to your car and trunk, um, all contactless, uh, uh, process. So that was really successful. And the week after on the 23rd, the state allowed Orange County to open up full retail, including all shopping centers. So from that, we have about 10 more days, we decided to do a reopening on June 1st. Well, that um, reopening was fully in plan. And unfortunately, because of all the protests and the civil unrest, we felt it was safer for everyone to, um, so that we remain closed. So we actually have a um, not opened on June 1st and decided to reopen again tomorrow. So tomorrow will be um, sort of my day back and I'll be back in a suit and tie again, um, something to get used to. But I'll focus the next section really on what the reopening means and some of the measures that we have uh, put in place for the, uh, um, the reopening. So as, first of all, we're gonna have limited operating hours. Um, I think Carlos just mentioned um, that, uh, you know, all of us are, are sort of still um, adapting to this and of course the limited hours will allow us and our stores and everyone else to be able to deep and thoroughly clean and make sure that it's a safe environment for all. So the reduced hours will be from uh, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday and this is actually a three-hour reduction from our normal operating hours which usually ran from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. and then um, on Sunday it'll go from noon 12 o'clock to 7 o'clock p.m. And we will also have reserved hours for the vulnerable population for the first two hours of each day from Monday through Saturday. And so that's, that will be from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. reserved for that, um, that uh, population. And we're going to make sure that we open with the highest standard of cleanliness um, to ensure the health and safety of all of our employees, tenants, guests, all alike. So we're going to have increased focus, uh, frequency, and intensity of the cleaning protocols, especially on the disinfection of high touch areas, surfaces, floors, and any shared equipment by employees, all that will be um, cleaned several times throughout the day. Um, we have installed, and this was um, something I I'd never thought of, but installed a UVC disinfecting light uh, in the air handlers so that it it, it mitigates um, the virus from sort of coming in through the air. And also we have even increased the percentage of outside air to the center to create a positive airflow. And uh, that's something actually medical buildings are doing as well. So um, it is something that, that we can do to try to um, make sure that the indoor environment is safe as well. Um, as I mentioned, we already had the sand sanitizer stations um, through, at all entrances and really throughout the center, um, even before uh, you know we closed, but uh, you know now uh, just, um, they're, they're obviously going to be a key portion of this uh, staying um, healthy and safe. And you probably see on one of the, uh, um, the uh, points that we have, uh, it is to uh, encourage people to, of course, not only wash your hands, but use our hand sanitizing stations um, frequently. We have touch-free interactions, meaning that all of our entrances and restroom doors um, are touch free. So you, you don't have to have touch the doorknob or, or, or twist anything to open it. Um, there's a wave of your hand, it, it, it opens uh, type of thing. So it, uh, it, it, it creates less touch points. Um, and this is something that actually our city and our county requires, city of Costa Mesa and Orange County requires that face masks. So we will require all of our, anybody who's on property at South Coast Plaza, including our guests to have face masks at all times. And that even starts at the parking lot. Um, we're going to have extensive social distancing measures uh, that includes one-way directional traffic uh, throughout the center. Uh, we're going to have limited common area seating, uh, limited elevator capacity or uh, occupancy, and we have installed plexiglass shield screens at all of our concierge desks. Um, so speaking of concierge desks, um, they're offering free face masks and uh, individual hand sanitizer wipes to those that need it or um, those that uh, um, uh, request for it. And they're also handing out free bottled water because our drinking fountains will be temporarily closed. So speaking of some of the, uh, you know, uh, temporary, I guess, uh, pause uh, on some of the amenities, um, our valet parking will be temporarily closed. Our carousel rides will be closed. 
um, the drinking fountains, as I mentioned, will um, not be operating at this time. And the stroller and wheelchair lend programs are going to be uh, on pause, as well as a package check. And our VIP access suite will also be closed for now. Um, and we're also going to, of course, require all of our retailers and restaurants to follow our guidelines to at least meet or exceed our standards and at the same time to make sure that they follow the industry guidelines that are out there for especially restaurants. Um, and this, as I mentioned, is a um, overall uh, guideline that we have to all follow, including all of our vendors, all of our deliveries, all of our contractors. They all have to, you know, wear face masks, for example, social distancing uh, practices and all that. And our employees, especially the customer facing employees, will even have a further screening. And this will be a temperature screening that they're going to be checked every day before they get into uh, um, uh, their uh, hours or work. So as you can see, we really put a lot of, uh, to make sure that it is a safe and healthiest environment for all. And uh, uh, you know, while we know it's a risk to open any kind of sort of public spaces right now, um, because the virus is still out there, we have no vaccine, but it is a way that we could try to mitigate and um, you know, have a safe environment for um, not only just the shoppers, but of course for our employees as well. And um, I'll focus the last section sort of a little bit about, you know, some of the items that I think that we could do or try to um, uh, try to think about as we, uh, you know, move forward into this new reality. And we've all, I'm sure, been sitting on a ton of webinars and calls. And um, I think everyone is sort of shifting. And we just heard from Don, of course, Visit California, that, uh, you know, yes, all of us will be gearing towards the drive market, the domestic market at first. And um, of, of course, I, I believe that that is some, something that um, we all have to sort of adapt and do. Um, from my standpoint, um, of course, we can't lose sight of the international recovery. Um, you know, Don mentioned it as well. I think that it'll sort of grow out, um, you know, from the uh, domestic into the uh, uh, North America and, of course, um, you know, Canada, Mexico being a part of it. And, of course, beyond that, um, for us, China is our number one market. But obviously, we have a long road um, to get you know, that to see that business move. But I think we have to pay attention to one is their the origin country, um, wherever it is that you're trying to get a customer from, what is your case count like and what is your current situation like? And I think that affects it. So case, for example, Brazil, probably are not, well, for now, we of course don't have any flights, but probably not going to see any, anything, any movement out of that, um, that, that country for a while. Just because they're they're the ones um, you know right behind us um, you know having having thousands of tens of thousands of cases new cases a day um, two is of course on the airlift um, that uh, without airlift they can't get here and I think Don talked about the uh, the U S China um, uh, sort of the aviation um, uh, allowance and uh, while it's good to see that being eased um, is still far from of course normal. Um, so it will take some time for that to normalize and for us to see really some significant traffic of people coming back. And uh, lastly, it is the visa, visa issuance, um, and that includes the students. Um, you know, when it comes time for students returning in the fall, are they going to back, be back in our universities in the U.S. to study abroad? Um, you know, nowadays, I mean, all of, a lot of universities have adapted to online studies and online courses um, and uh, doing maybe about 50 percent in class uh, versus online, um, you know, will the international students take a semester break uh, or a year break, um, you know, to come back at a later time when they actually have the in-person experience. So all that is to be considered whether they'll, they're going to be returning or not, specifically for that international student segment. And um, next, I think we should all think about ways where we can adapt to be more contactless. I talked about this curbside delivery, uh, well, not delivery, curbside uh, pickup program. And uh, while that program is going to continue, and Carlos mentioned that as well, they're continuing to do that service. And I think that more and more, uh, you know, people will be utilizing this kind of service. But I think that um, to look for other ways to have less contact will be, will be uh, the way to go as well. Um, so one example is to open up contactless payment system if you don't have that already. So that means the Apple Pay, Google Pay, um, which I know domestically we don't, we don't use a whole lot of, but I think that 
internationally, especially if you're, you have a lot of China market, I'm sure you've heard of Alipay, WeChat Pay, make sure those are enabled, make sure those are open, um, because that allows people not only for another way to pay, but it is a contactless way of payment. Um, to me, when we when we insert the chip and having to um, key in our pin on the pin pad, that is the one area that people touch the most, you know, for every transaction. So having a contact, contactless uh, payment certainly helps. And then uh, also, I think more important than ever right now, partnership is, is, is going to be key. Um, and we're, that's why we're all in this call together. That's why we are um, all here together to support each other to make sure that we get through this. And I think that partnership is going to be key for us to get out of this, especially something along your, you know, either your city or region or even the state of, you know, California that, um, um, you know, led by Visit California. I think that there's a lot that we can all do together to make sure that we welcome our visitors back, to make sure that we all have the same message and to make sure that we all, um, you know, really have the consistent um, uh, measures across the board to make everyone feel um, comfortable and uh, welcomed. So all that um, is also including changes to your um, future events planned. Um, there's no large gatherings at this point, so we have to unfortunately make some changes to our exhibitions and uh, festivals. Um, you know, those will have to change, but virtually, I think that there's, um, just like we're doing this call right now, certainly have an opportunity, and uh, we could, um, you know, uh, so during this time, um, I have the best examples of some of the luxury retailers. They've done some amazing virtual fashion shows, uh, client touches. I think that there's a lot of ways for us to engage with our customers still and I know a lot of DMOs are doing some really creative things about you know uh, using virtual to kind of showcase their city and uh, staying on people's top of mind to make sure that they um, you know have that available and be able to um, you know to translate into a uh, real visit um, you know as, as soon as it, it opens up so I think all of that gives us some idea as to how we can do and of course you know the dry market I mentioned, um, you know, it is it is something. But for me, maybe I'll focus on the domestic markets of um, since I'm technically international. Um, maybe I'll focus on the uh, the Asian Americans um, or um, some multicultural um, you know segment that we could try to encourage or try to have them come out to our destination um, versus the the general you know. Uh, uh, locals. So I think that there's ways that we can sort of adapt ourselves and, uh, um, and of course, still thrive, um, you know, as we embark on this uh, recovery road. So thanks again. I know that, um, you know, everyone's sort of on the same boat. Um, tourism is really tough right now, and it's going to take some time, but it's really encouraging to see how quickly that it is you know, hopefully resilient to recover. And, um, you know, for me, another segment of um, that got hit is the retail. Um, so while that's still all changing, um, I think that this will all be, um, you know, as we, re as more businesses, as more cities and areas reopen, we can all, you know, kind of, kind of be able to adapt very quickly as to what we can do next. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll all be, uh, uh, the next call will be very different. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Uh, so appreciate your time, your knowledge, sharing your experience. Um, I did want to mention that, unfortunately, Don did have to hop off the call early. Um, I did receive one question for him, which was from Lu Ruthie Larson. Would you mind clarifying? He mentioned having information on their site about businesses and their opening information and required safety measures. Is that for hotels specifically or all tourism and travel businesses? Don did answer. He said the businesses shown on the website will be our TMD hotels, any of our members and our restaurant Dine LA partners. You must be one of the stakeholder groups because they are the groups that are funding the initiative. Um, I can see if there's any other questions for Don if you want to email me and maybe we can get somebody from LA Tourism to help answer them. Thank you, Brian. If you do have questions, you can either submit them to me privately um, or wait till the end. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to continue. Up last, we have Corey Breton, CRO Global Attractions at Legends. Corey Breton has enjoyed a 14-year career in professional sports that has taken him from one side of the country to the other. Prior to joining Legends, Breton was the Executive Vice President of Sales for the expansion MLS franchise, Los Angeles Football Club, which took the pitch for the first time in March of 2018. 
Prior to joining LAFC, Brenton Holt held the role of Vice President, Sales and Service for the Minnesota Timberwolves and Lynx, a position he held for two years. And prior to joining the Timberwolves and Lynx, Brenton also worked with the Atlanta Hawks and the Phoenix Suns, and as well as many other things that um, I didn't want to take the time because we'd love to hear um, all the information that you have to share. So thank you, Corey, for joining us um, all the way from... I'm in LA. It's good. Oh, you're here in LA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm right in your backyard. So um, all, all is good. But definitely appreciate it, Sarah. Um, and I, I think, you know, our perspective, Legends perspective, may be a little bit different because we do operate in so many different cities. And I think throughout the course of COVID, uh, what we've recognized is that this, at least in the United States, has become very regionalized. Um, you know, we're fortunate enough, we have headquarters in Los Angeles. Um, Dallas, New York, and London. And when we would get on a phone call, the, the, the Dallas response was much different than the LA response. Um, and London was a few weeks behind us and the way New York is, is going at it. So I think first and foremost, if you settle on this slide, I just want to give an overview of who we are and what we're about. As I don't know how familiar folks are. And Sarah, I want to thank you for offering me the opportunity to speak. And obviously it happened through Lori uh, Testata, which I know a lot of you know, um, so she she was able to connect me. Um, but Legends is really a, a holistic agency that sits behind our operators, our partners, and we can play a multitude of different roles. Uh, but we work with best in class brands, and specifically in LA, you know, we are working our full wheel of services at SoFi Stadium, that some of you might be familiar with out near the airport. Uh, as previously mentioned. We offered our full wheel of services for Los Angeles Football Club, uh, which is LAFC, which is right next to the Coliseum. We do food and beverage for the Coliseum. We do food and beverage for uh, the Rose Bowl. We do food and beverage and merchandise for the Anaheim Angels. So we're, we're very well vested in Los Angeles. And then finally, we run and operate OUE Sky Space, which is located in downtown LA. And as you flip to the next slide, um, you know, we, we offer what we call a wheel of services, legitimately a wheel of services. And so from an attractions perspective, as it relates to observation decks and specifically uh, attractions, if an individual or an owner's group, uh, uh, an investment group is looking to open up an observation deck in any respective city, similar to what happened in OUE, if you guys remember OUE Skyspace, you know, prior to them having the slide, we were a part of that process where we can conduct a feasibility study to determine if it, it's actually an opportunity that's worth looking at. And then we also can be a project manager. So we can run and operate everything from start to finish to make sure the project comes in on time and on budget. Um, and so our lens through COVID, I think this wheel has served a, a vast and I would say an important purpose is because we touch every aspect of the business for our partners. Um, we not only handle the planning process on the front end, making sure the P&L is correct, but we also handle all admission sales, all sponsorship sales for all of our properties. We do all food and beverage um, and, and merchandising as well. And I think as we look at the guest experience and the guest journey, our number one objective is previously mentioned by the folks that uh, Brian and, and, uh, and Don that went before me is safety. And so safety is number one. That's what we're focused on. And I think our wheel provides us that opportunity. And what we'll talk about today is really the global tech solutions uh, piece of the business. You know, Brian hit, hit on it and he mentioned the fact for the guest experiences it could dra dramatically change and how we uh, really go through an attraction, how we go to an event, a live venue, um, and obviously contactless, frictionless, touchless experiences will be at the top of that. So our global tech solution, I guess, spoke of the wheel, if you will, was really a focus of ours as we entered into COVID. And as you click to the next slide. So when we, um, when COVID first hit, we operate a lot of arenas, um, a, a lot of different venues, stadiums, where you're bringing 20,000 to 70,000 people inside for a specific, you know, event. And it might last two and a half to four hours. We also operate from a food and beverage perspective. Um, 40 Live Nation amphitheaters across the globe. Um, you know, and I mentioned previously, we have attractions in all the major cities, Seattle, Los Angeles, New York, London, uh, Boston, Atlanta, Chicago, Miami, Vegas. 
So from our lens, we started to see this pushback of like, what do we do now? Like, how, how do we prepare our space? How do we come back online when we do have the ability to come online? And I think all of us would say that when this first kind of shut down, the country shut down in March, um, this has probably been one of the most fluid situations I've ever been a part of, we've ever been a part of, because as we just found out, hotels are going to open on Friday. Like that's breaking news, you know, and things like that continue to pop up over the course of the time. And so when we looked at the tools and resources that Legends had, we actually created a venue reintegration platform. Um, and we spoke to a lot of individuals. And I think first and foremost, we were concerned for the safety of our employees. We have a lot of frontline worker ambassadors. How do we get them to the point where they feel comfortable and com confident coming back to work? Because um, ultimately, that's going to be our first step. If we can build that type of confidence, hopefully that will lead to consumer confidence. And so safety and hygiene were a number one concern for us. Um, and if you click to the next slide, you'll see kind of the way we looked at it. You know, we looked at the tools we said, and, and you know, I think first and foremost, we, we wanted to focus on venue health. Venue operations was second, and then I think fan experience was third. And when I talk about venue health, um, what we've actually developed, and, and we've added individuals to our team that come from the medical background, and so they've been able to help us build out a checklist, an appropriate checklist, for all of our venues, whether it's AT&T Stadium in Dallas, Texas, that will host 70,000 people hopefully this fall, all the way down to, you know, OUE Skyspace, where we're expecting right now to operate because of the elevators and the experience you have in an observation deck and the challenges that exist with an elevator. How do you maintain social distancing in an elevator? We're still trying to figure that out. But um, at the same time, you know, the process that we went through is creating a checklist that we can send out to all of our venues and to ensure our employees that we're gonna bring them back in a safe uh, manner. And then, you know, from there, it's, we'll go through a bunch of different items here, um, but planning and design and implementation and messaging and engagement were kind of the, the next steps. So I look at, you know, planning and design, we looked at a lot of our spaces, and I'll use attractions specifically, and we've had to re redesign our footprint, if you will. Um, you know, we might bring food and beverage on later, uh, post us opening up the space to the, the general patrons, like as we, we previously mentioned. And so I think through that, um, if anybody has any additional questions about this, more than happy to answer. But the venue reintegration plan was something that we rolled out to all of our partners, um, ad hoc. And, and then from there, you know, we all really are setting ourselves up. And I think, you know, the fact that it is such a regional approach as far as the reaction to COVID based on the density of the population, <laughs> we might have insight that other folks don't because we are running and operating stadium tours right now in Dallas, Texas for AT&T Stadium. We've opened up uh, some of our other opportunities in, in the South, the Southeast specifically in Atlanta. Um, and so we're, we're learning on the job, if you will, what can hopefully influence and make it a lot smoother once we do open in New York, in Atlanta, or I should say in LA and in Seattle, uh, which has been very beneficial for us. Um, so as we, we, we went through this, we put the, together the checklist, and if you click to the next slide, this is where it gets a little bit interesting as well. I'm sure a lot of you folks are, are heard about the temperature checks. Is temperature checks the right way to go for employees? Uh, I think Brian had mentioned they're doing that for all their employees. You know, Legends, we have over 40,000 employees, frontline ambassadors, if we're up and running at full capacity. Um, if you look across all of our stadiums and our arenas, and if, uh, yeah, stay right here. So we actually found this company um, called Cleared for Work, and I don't know if anybody's familiar with them, but it's basically an app or web-based site that each of your employees can go to prior to coming on site, and that way you kind of make the ease of it a, a, a lot more efficient and frictionless for them. So we're not necessarily gonna do thermal checks for our staff. What we do is we build out a profile for each of them through Cleared for Work and legitimately before they come into work, they can go ahead and, and scan themselves right through their phone. And then when they come in, we can scan them and we can keep a tally of where they're at because a little piece of this and, and um, has to weigh heavy on all of us and just being aware of it is liability as well. What's the liability of us as an organization? What's the liability to our employees? What's the liability to our guests? And that's something we took a lot of time to try to uncover and make sure that when we did open, we were doing it in a manner that not only was safe, 
but ultimately protected our spaces. And more importantly, because we operate as a white label agency behind our partners, protected our partners as well. And so if you click to the next slide, you'll see a little bit of the background around um, what is cleared for work. And you can read here, but I mean, it's a comprehensive program that they developed that was focused really on venue hygiene, um, fan experience, venue operations, and technology to, to protect the public assembly guest employees. Um, it's self-assessment. Um, and I know we've seen a lot, and, and at least we have, you know, a lot of, uh, I would so call, so I uh, would call um, the so-called checklist, the so-called experts. And it's hard to cite, decipher and filter through what is real or what is not, and more importantly, what is uh, CDC or FDA approved. Um, these folks have gone through all the proper protocols, um, and then I love the fact that it's daily and, and, and it's automated check-ins on the employees as well to ensure their safety, and that way nothing slips through the cracks. And it takes away, I would say, the liability from me, and if, I, if I'm an operations manager, or I'm a GM of a property, um, if something slips through the cracks or you, know, you, you have an a, a employee um, walk in at a, at a period of time where they might not necessarily be conducting a thermal check, this, this can offset that, um, which is really, really good. And you see the individuals that it's co-founded by, uh, folks a lot smarter than me. Uh, they have a, a DR in front of their name, so we trust them. Uh, but I think for us, this puts us in a situation where we found a partner out there for something that we couldn't do. Even though we built out a venue reintegration plan for all of our venues, we still wanted to take it a step further because I do believe in, in kind of the legends model is we did feel as we entered into COVID, I'm sure the same way everybody else did, is that something good is going to come out of this. We're going to become like a lot more efficient, a lot smarter, a lot more advanced in our operations. And I think this will be something that will probably stay with us for the foreseeable future um, as, as we run and operate. And so as we look at this, I think that the next transition, if you could flip the slide, Um, very rare is an opportunity um, in our life where we're open 365, um, literally from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. in some instances at our attractions for and our, our sites for us to be able to take a pause and work on the long-term projects. And so when COVID shut down, and I think it was probably middle of March, this was a project that we were already working on, but it was hard to focus a ton of our um, mental capacity as you're trying to operate multiple business or a business and at the same time focus on a large project like this that could enhance the guest experience and so when we knew March 15th we're in it for like kind of the long haul we felt at that point in time it was going to be either mid-April um, to early May before we opened and now we sit in June right we're still waiting but at the same time it gave us an opportunity to look at our technology and how we could remove uh, the one-to-one -one connection that a lot of people have already maybe this was gonna force adoption. This was gonna force a cashless experience. This was gonna force individuals to go to a kiosk and work through technology and create a frictionless experience as well. And so we, re we revisited our uh, kiosk experience at all of our properties. And we use that technology discipline that we have in our wheel of services. And they started to build out a platform so we could actually achieve what we see in our phone or what we see on the web because right now our kiosk experience was 15 steps, took eight minutes long, didn't accept all the payments. Um, we didn't have all the language abilities that we needed to. Um, we weren't collecting data the way we needed to um, and leveraging all those things. And so now we have multiple languages. It's a lot more quicker and efficient. We can eliminate and or reduce box office, which helps us. Um, and a lot of from a cost perspective is I know all of us are looking to eliminate or bring down some of the costs. Um, huge upsell opportunities where people can self-select as well. Um, and then ultimately we wanted to mirror the mobile and or web buying process. Um, and then as you click to the next slide, this really hits on what we already know. Uh, but the, there's a ton of benefits for the guests as we come out of COVID. And I think our world post COVID will be forever changed. Even if we eliminate social distancing um, and even if we you know, take off the mask at some point, I, I think our adoption of technology will be far greater just due to the fact that it's kind of forced us to adopt that. And I think it's a real opportunity to look at all of our POS systems. And so that's something else we've done and making sure they're fully integrated and tap into our data infrastructure um, and driven to reduce, I would say, exposure with others, but more importantly, operational benefits just from a, a safety and hygiene and decrease in expenses. 
Um, and so we've spent the last, I'd say, couple months working on preparation with our IT team. And this would have never happened. This probably would have taken a year. Uh, but because we had hyper focus on it for the last, you know, two months, we've been able to accomplish it. And we're ready to launch when OUE is, has the ability to launch, which is looking like, you know, early July, kind of that phase three for attractions. Um, and then ultimately that will cross over to all of our other properties as well. Um, and then finally, you can go into the last slide. Um, ton, of, ton of benefits for us as the operator. And then the, the final piece, and, and I, uh, I didn't have it approved yet, so I wasn't able to show, um, but I think it's really important for guests, especially as we get filtered information, is how we clearly and authentically communicate to the guests and what we communicate, when we communicate, um, is gonna be imperative. I think throughout this process, one thing that I've learned is depending on my uh, channel that I select or who I follow on Twitter, I get news that's polar opposite of what I just heard previously. I have no idea what's, what's accurate, what's true. And so we took a lot of time, energy, and effort to build out a communication, I would say model and process, and I can share what our template is post this, but it basically breaks everything down into what I like to call emojis. Um, so that they'll become synonymous with wash your hands, wear a mask, can maintain social distancing. And that way you don't necessarily need signage at every single stop that lists out things. It's going to be more signals, if you will, uh, similar to what you see right here. And then we'll place them throughout our experiences, whether it's a stadium, an arena or attraction. And then once again, that provides us the ability to kind of put the liability back on the guests to adhere to those things because the last thing we wanna do is put one of our frontline ambassadors and or uh, frontline workers in a situation where they get in a confrontation because somebody doesn't wanna abide by these. And that's been a major fear of ours as we head back into what I'll call the new normal is how do we maintain um, and, and stick to safety and hygiene regulations that have been established without at the same time feeling like we have to enforce them on every single individual that comes through one of our spaces. Because I think one thing we noticed too is that every single individual is kind of treating this a little bit differently, um, the severity and the seriousness of it. And so we've, we've talked about how we're gonna communicate, what we're gonna communicate, making sure that in our pre and post emails that we directly list it out um, on our website that it's clearly stated. Um, and then the signage throughout the space, we've created a checklist for that as well. So um, that's really where we're at from a legends perspective. Like I said, I, I'm fortunate, I feel very fortunate that we have the ability and the bandwidth to have all the arenas, the stadiums and the attractions, not only here in LA, but across the globe. So we're able to learn from each other, especially as, as you know, I would say locations or properties in specific locations are at a different phase. Um, Seattle's in, in phase one and a half. I didn't even know that existed, right? Where we're in phase two and, and New York just opened on Monday. And I think New York and London are in a way different situation than we're in here in LA just due to the fact they're heavily dependent on public transportation. And we'll, we're very curious to see what happens in each of those specific cities and, and how that will impact our business moving forward. But uh, hopefully this helps. I know it's a little bit different angle than the, uh, the other two folks, but once again, do appreciate uh, you opening up and, and uh, being willing to, to offer me an opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Corey. Um, I don't know about everybody else. We, we really tried to create a panel that was um, diverse from DMO perspective to shopping perspective to attraction and experience. And um, uh, this was great. Very, very helpful, Corey. Thank you, Brian. Um, I know Don isn't here, but thank you, Don. <laughs> um, I, I do know that we're getting the question about sharing this presentation. It does seem that we're going to be able to share it at least audio, but hoping to get um, approval to be able to share um, the overall presentation with everybody. Um, again, uh, thank you again, um, Corey, Brian, and Dawn. Uh, thank you to all of our members, guests, and first time attendees for joining us today. It's so exciting. Uh, bummer we got capped at 100, as we know we had over 100 people. Um, if you have questions or comments during this time, um, please, please submit them. Right now we're gonna do um, a short Q&A and I'm going to try to go through these chats to see if there's anything that's sent to me. Um, it looks like Diana has a question for you, Corey. Um, after we go into phase four, will the new SoFi Stadium be able to open at full capacity or will, those, where, will there still be reduced capacity? 
Uh, yeah, and, and I apologize, I probably went on a little long there too, so I didn't leave too much time for questions. But, um, uh, you know, I think we're watching what happens, and I think this is where it's it's really unique situation because it's so focused on um, the governor and the mayor and what they sign off on. And I don't think I've ever been through in a situation where it's so hyper locally focused and or state by state, region by region. You know, I've seen these coalitions, but specifically as it relates to SoFi Stadium, um, they're still cleared and scheduled to open at the, at the start of the NFL preseason. Um, you talk about investing $5 billion into a facility that can't operate at, at full capacity. Uh, we will run tours, private tours, um, and events, private events out of the space as well. And I could foresee those opening because we'll be able to maintain social distancing prior to us being at full capacity. Um, now, on the same token, this is where it gets interesting, is Dallas, um, AT&T Stadium, they initially mentioned that they would open at 25% capacity. In the past week, they mentioned that they now moved that to 50% capacity. So I, I just feel like it's so fluid right now. Um, I think LA, given you know the density of our population, I can't imagine us seeing people in the stands at least until the fall. But once again, that's my personal opinion, not expert in any way, shape, or form. Just living here uh, in LA and experiencing what I've experienced, I, I, I really doubt that we'll see um, more than 25%, I would say capacity, at least until October or a vaccine is figured out. Um, and I think other states may take their chances because of the impact it has financially on them. But uh, I, I don't foresee uh, our governor and or mayor making those decisions. So. So I have no idea is basically. <laughs> I think that's that's the um, temperament. Uh, yeah. Reason, right? Like everything is so fluid and it's uh, important to create like a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. I know in leisure pass group that's been a lot of it is just kind of laying out what are all the options here and how do we look at everything holistically and how do we trigger and move um, as quickly as possible and pivot um, as we need to so um, okay we have another question seems that it is for you Corey <laughs> um, I know you said you are still working out the logistics of opening sky space is there a projected opening time or still too soon? I know I've been asking this question a lot too. So. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think right now we assume that if everything continues to go as planned, it would probably be the beginning of July. So right around that July 4th holiday is mentally what we have in our head and what we're planning for. Um, you know, I think the other piece that we didn't talk about as we talk about employees is, you know, what employees do we bring back to the office space as well and how that office space will transition and how will we maintain social distancing even in our offices and so that's another piece we're, we're looking at trying to get our employees back into the space uh mid-june so june 15th i think it is or yeah june 15th is a monday and then uh set ourselves up for kind of a a july 1st second um open for first responders, com completely complimentary type of mentality. And that's what we're gonna do across our portfolio. And I'm sure we've seen that a lot of other spots as well. Um, I know Lori shared an earlier email from San Diego Zoo where they're gonna reopen and just open it up for their members and, and some first responders. So initially I think we'll use that as a, almost like a stress test that a lot of our properties open up for first responders, see what type of, of uh, you know, throughput we can achieve and then open right around 4th of July would be the hope. Now that very likely could get pushed back two weeks. I think everything's on kind of that two week cycle. Um, but I think for Seattle and LA specifically, we're, our hope is to open them um, by mid July at the latest. And then, uh, you know, we're in New York, like they said, they just opened up really their offices on Monday. And um, given the city transportation, we'll see what happens there, but specifically probably around mid, mid July, hopefully. Thank you, Corey. Um, so we have a question for anyone on the panel, or if there's somebody who really wants to answer this and you're here attending, um, you can raise your hand virtually and we'll um, see if we have time to call on you. But from Rich at Big Bus um, LA, what plans are you putting in place to deal with guests who refuse to wear masks or follow social distancing rules without putting frontline teams in a potentially dangerous situation? Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to take that, Brian or Corey or, yeah, um, I, I don't know if you guys saw the language that Disney put together, um, but they kind of put the onus back on the guest. And it's, uh, I, I think, you know, if anything, we've learned, uh, I would say, 
at least me, I'll speak for myself that I learned through the protests. It's the onus is on me as an individual to look at it through another, uh, other people's lens and other people's eyes. And so, um, you know, we'll put all the safety precautions in order. But the one thing we have discussed is that you'll have an ambassador at the beginning or a frontline worker kind of giving the 10 rules in order to be in this space, be in this observation deck, be in this building, be in this arena, and then repeat the rules over and over again with every potential signage opportunity that we have. But we don't want to, we don't feel comfortable putting our, our frontline ambassadors in a security type of situation where they're going to have to dictate to somebody. You know, the unique thing is, is, is I go back to what we're able to see at, uh, in Dallas, Texas at AT&T Stadium. They're doing tours right now. Uh, they've limited the number of people down to 20 uh, per a tour. They maintain social distancing. Half the people uh, that walk through the door, in order to get in, you have to wear a mask. But as soon as you get in, it's your choice to continue to wear the mask. Half the people take the mask off immediately. The other half keep it on. Um, but mainly everybody respects kind of their, their space, if you will. And so I, I think it's just going to come down to common courtesy. And I would, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, uh, how they'll make, you know, if, whether or not it'll be mandatory here in Los Angeles, um, uh, that you have to wear a mask completely indoors. But I know as I walk by restaurants that have opened over the weekend, it doesn't look like it's mandatory. So, um, I, uh, I don't know what we'll see, but I think just taking every precaution necessary in the front end. And then making sure that you have language in there that kind of puts the onus back on the guests to abide by it. Um, I, I think it's the safest play. Thanks, Corey. And Brian, do you want to add anything to that? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, and uh, it's because we're privately owned also, but it's not just because of that. Really, it is uh, mandated by our city, as I mentioned, and our county to require face masks at this time. So we will adhere to that. So meaning that um, that's why we offer free masks for anyone who comes into the center without one. We'll be happy to provide one for them, but we will require them to wear them at all times when they're in the shopping center. So um, our securities are going to be enforcing that. Um, we'll politely ask them to leave or you know, not going to throw anyone out by force, of course, but I think that there's um, probably going to be some cases and uh, I really wonder how, you know, sort of this reopening will take uh, shape. But I think, uh, you know, as Corey mentioned, I think a lot of people by now have uh, sort of adapted a new reality and they understand that this is a protection, not only uh, really not for yourself, it's really to protect, protect uh, against the uh, uh, actually protection um, that you don't spread. Um, so I think that, um, you know, people will respect that. Thank you. I love having the different perspectives. Um, well, again, thank you again, um, Corey, Brian, you guys have been great. Um, thank you to everybody who's joined us today. If this is your first time, I hope you enjoyed it. It's definitely a different type of event as we're usually all in a room and can give big hugs. Um, I'm sending you all a virtual hug right now. If you have any additional questions or comments um, at any time, please feel free to visit our website um, or email myself or Misha. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Um, if it pertains to this event, what's coming up in the future. We are actively meeting, communicating as a board and discussing um, what the future for TTMA will look like. Um, we are uh, most likely going to do some other event coming up, whether it's gonna be virtual or live, and hopefully we'll be letting all of you guys know. Um, and in closing, um, I wanted to share some photos from Las Vegas over this past weekend um, that I got from someone from my team. It clearly shows that people are ready to get out and enjoy life once again, whether it's safe or not, I'm not the one to judge there. But here's to a brighter future ahead of us. Um, we've sort of weathered through all of this with, um, out having any warning and um, it's been tough. And I, I, I think, you know, we're sort of on this trajectory um, of growth and positivity and I, I hope that happens and I hope I wish all of you guys the best um, hope you enjoy everything um, coming up in the future and the rest of your week and I guess at this time um, we're gonna kind of unshare the screen unmute everybody uh I think you I cut out if anybody wants to say hi or bye to ever, anybody um, uh, we'll be able to do that at this time. So I don't know, Misha, if you can unshare your screen and we can go to gallery view and unmute everybody. That would be amazing. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. And don't feel like you have to show your face if you don't want to, but, um, oh, look, it's so beautiful. <laughs>
This is awesome. Does anybody from the board want to say anything? That was just great job, Sarah and Michelle. I think that was amazing, especially for our first uh, virtual TTMA meeting. Um, and thank you, Corey and Brian, and of course, Don, so much for participating today. I've learned a lot from each one of you. So thank you. It's so good to see everyone. Thank you. Yep, thank you. This was really good. Thanks. Right. It was great seeing everybody. Great this seeing everybody. Fantastic. Thank, thank you me. to the presenters and to the board and to everyone that came. This is sitting up. Everybody. Hi, Jane. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Very informative. Okay, lead leading. We're good. I'm just going to stay with a smile. My cheeks will hurt. <laughs> <laughs> you look good, Sarah. It's good. Thank you. Hey, Sarah, what's, what's your email? I know I missed it on the slide earlier. Oh, yeah, no worries. My email is Sarah, S-A-R-A-H dot McCann. It's in my little tile up here at leisurepassgroup.com. So leisure and then pass, P-A-S-S group.com. And if uh, anybody just forgets mine or Misha's and sends one of us an email, we'll connect each other or reaches out to anybody else on the board. Um, and yep. it does look like hopefully we'll be able to share some presentations. So we'll follow up with everybody about that as well. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna email you. If you do need the email, you can always go to uh, you can reach out to us um, via the website too. If if you can't remember, the I just want to reach out to you and send you the current state and local executive actions that's in place. For every state, it's about 86 pages or so, but you can look at California and that's what they have currently. And it's updated either weekly or, or monthly, we don't know, but um, I think that if you follow that, you should be good to go. Wonderful, thank you so much, Leah. We appreciate sure. that. Sure. Can we share that with everybody? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Bye guys, thanks again. Thanks, Tim. Bye. So good see to ya. see you. You too. <laughs> All right, guys. I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. It was so great to see everybody. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Great job. Bye, everyone. Great to see you, everybody.